just come and be together. Shall we just pray? Our Father, as it has been prayed, we exalt your name, we bless your name, we worship you, and we recognize, Lord, that this is your work, and this is your word. You are eternal, O God, and therefore, who can fathom your ways except by the revelation of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts? We beg you and plead with you that move, Lord, over us, move over everyone here, and as the waters cover the sea. Father, let you be like the wind who moves in a way that pleases him and does what he likes. We beg you and ask for understanding and for a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we turn to Revelation chapter 1? Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Uh, Revelation chapter 1. It was announced the topic we're looking at is who is Christ, but the overshadowing topic or subject is greetings from Jesus Christ. And this is because if you look at verse 4, it is written, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and so on. And so this is a greeting, uh, a peculiar greeting, as I said last time when we looked at this particular scripture, a very peculiar greeting, uh, because it looks like God is revealing himself. He is introducing himself, uh, as the book Revelation means a revelation. Apocalypse means a revelation. And now we did look at a bit of, uh, at verse 4. We did look at verse 4. And we said that God was saying he is the one who is God the Father. That is who is and who was and who is to come. Describing the fact that God um, is, exists now. He is there. But God also has always when it says who was, has always existed. And it's also saying who is to come and who will always exist. So it is showing the eternity of God, that God has no beginning. He has always been there. He is here and will always be there. Uh, eternity from eternity to eternity. And then it also talks about the seven spirits who are before his throne. As you know, one day we shall look at this, the number seven. But as you know, seven is always a number of perfection. Um, if you read through, right through uh, Revelation, go to other scriptures, seven is always a number of perfection, of completeness. And so this is talking about uh, the seven spirits who are before the throne of God reflect the completeness of the Holy Spirit. It is, he is also God. And we looked at that the last time that we met. So this greeting that is going to the seven churches um, in Asia is a greeting from God the Father, a greeting from God the Son, a greeting from God the Holy Spirit. The whole Godhead is sending a greeting to the seven churches in Asia. And we, we said last time that this greeting then is not peculiar to the people in these um, churches, but it is also a greeting to you, Evangel Baptist Church, and to me, to all the churches from history coming up to now. This message is not a historical message, though there's a historical significance. This message is a relevant message today. These people were going under severe persecution. They were tortured. Some were even killed for the sake of the gospel. And they were saying, when is Jesus Christ coming? He died and he rose. Yes, but has he forgotten us? And therefore, now God speaks through um, uh, John, who wrote this book, and says, this is me now. God the Father, God the Son, I am God. And therefore now he sends a message to these brethren, which is a message to you and to me. Now, we 
now come to today's uh, subject. Let's go at uh, verse 5. Let's look at verse 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God, and Father, to him be glory and the dominion forever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. We shall not go to verse 8. I, I, I discovered the, the material was too much. But we shall look at verse 5, 6, and 7. And my approach will be just to de define terms, to define the terms that are there. Uh, the faithful witness, for instance, in verse 5, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, uh, who loves us and released us from our sins. What do these things mean? And then see what lessons we can learn. And then we shall go to verse 6, and then go to verse 7. As I was looking at this particular text, I, I, I became overwhelmed when I was... Uh, studying who Jesus Christ is, I was overwhelmed. And I began to realize, as I was defining these terms, searching and trying to understand them, I began to realize that there's not enough words to describe who Jesus Christ is. This, even if you take all the words in your mind, all your life, and put them together, they cannot describe Jesus Christ sufficiently. I felt so inadequate. As I was looking at the, at the Christ like you are standing here, and then there's a whole landscape of who he is. And, and I became so, I felt so small. I've never felt so small like this before. And I began to see that I am dealing with a great person of the greatest kind, of greatest splendor, of overwhelming uh, beauty and power and glory. I could not believe it. I could not believe it. I felt tiny. And so my prayer to you and for you and for myself I will just do what I can. My prayer, brethren, let him reveal himself to you himself. I, I am too small to reveal Christ to you. But let him reveal himself to you. And I think you'll be more blessed than what I am going to say. My words will just be a vehicle of a weak uh, mortal that is off. Let's proceed to our subject. Who is Christ Jesus? Firstly, let's, let's, let's look at, um, at, at verse 5. Firstly, the Lord Jesus Christ calls himself the faithful witness. What does the faithful witness mean? Well, as you all know, a witness, we all know, I think, uh, what a witness is. A, a witness is someone who's got a testimony. A witness is somebody who has observed something and seen something in court. Uh, they use this quite a lot uh, because when they are, uh, things have arisen, they'll say, do you have a witness? And then you stand in the witness box and then you testify to what you saw or to what you know if you're a professional, maybe a medical doctor or an accountant or whatever you are, an engineer, you testify to what you know about that particular thing. Um, and so this is what um, Christ is saying. He says he is a faithful witness. If you go back in the original languages, the word uh, witness actually means materia. Um, which is in the modern days is a martyr. A martyr is a person who dies for their faith. A martyr is somebody who dies for their faith. So the word witness and the word testimony are basically uh, regarded as the same in, 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 in this uh, martyr. Someone who dies for their faith. And indeed, as you know, as history testifies and the scriptures testify, Jesus Christ died, not only for his faith, but for you and me. He was beyond a martyr 
uh, a martyr who died for his faith, but him he took upon our sins and died for more than just what he believed. He died for you and me. We shall look at that as we go on. And so when we uh, look at the witness and, and so on, um, it is you know what you are saying. Now, if, as we look at this uh, five again, it says a faithful witness. There are false witnesses that are there on this earth. And some people are in prison right now because it is a false witness. Somebody somewhere told a lie. And when they told the lie, that man was arrested or even killed. Some people have died. Of innocent people have died because they, they are false witness. They are false witnesses over the years who have caused uh, people to die innocently. But Christ is saying he is a faithful witness. He is a, 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 a witness who tells the truth. He is not false. He even said, verily, verily, I say to you, I am telling you the truth, says Christ Jesus. And so we uh, want to establish this very fact that Christ is a faithful witness. He only says the truth. And the truth, how, what is he a faithful witness of? He tells the truth of what the Father has given him. He says, I have come not on my own, but I have been sent by my Father. And he says, he can only say what the Father has given him. And because he's entrusted with this message, he only has to say the truth. He is not interested in bringing glory to himself. He's not interested in being on the pedestal and being seen. No, he comes to present a message, and that message is from heaven, from the Father. The other thing is that he remains faithful and consistent throughout. You remember when the devil came and tried to tempt him. Turn this stone to bread. You are hungry. You've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And it's not that fasting that you and me, uh, you sneak out, eat a packet of chips, and, and then just plain, just absolute fast. Absolute fast. And so he became hungry. The enemy says, look, turn, look. You are a son of God. What's your problem? You know, and there was to severe temptation at his wicked point. But he says it is written. He was faithful to his message because had he yielded to the devil, that was the end of you and me. And the father would not have been known and would not be saved, would not be sitting here today. But he was faithful to the end. He went through a lot of trials. At one time they tried to stone him, he had to escape. And so many other trials that Christ went to do, did, uh, uh, trials that he suffered, but he continued. At no time did Jesus Christ change his testimony in order to survive. Because there was pressure, as we always excuse ourselves. Because I'm under pressure, you should understand the temptation was too strong. Therefore, I'm going to do this and that. I'll find a shortcut. I'll go to a witch doctor. I'll, I'll compromise morally so that uh, I get the promotion. I'll be fired. I can't lose, afford to lose my job. So let me do this, obey my boss, and Play around with the figures and, and so that we can, the money, he can get away with the money. Otherwise, I'll lose my job. Christ did not do that. He was a faithful witness of God. He claimed he was from heaven. He proved he was from heaven. His message was consistent unto death. He was the chief martyr. Even on the cross, he was busy saving the Deep on the cross, that, that, uh, the other one was busy insulting him. The other one says, remember me, says, you'll be with me in paradise. Even his last breath, he was still faithful to his mission to the Father. Just a thought comes to my mind. Are you willing to pay the price? You pay the price in your life. If you look back since you claimed to be a Christian or you became a Christian up to date, 
Have you paid the price? Have you done this? Have you been a faithful witness? Have you stood your ground as a Christian? They have mocked you. They have despised you. They have given you a nickname. They have done all these things against you. Have you stood your ground with a testimony? I am born again. I believe in Jesus Christ. The past is gone. I am now a new creation. And Christ lives in me. I will not be ashamed. I will live like a Christian. Has this happened to you? Because there's no one here who has stood his faith by his faith unto death. How many of you have died for your faith? We are alive here. In the afternoon, we shall even be having lunch. So that shows that we are alive. So have you been faithful? Are you willing today to pay the price? Are you willing to pay the price of your faith? Or are we a people of shortcuts? Because the pressures of the world. And we forget and forsake our Savior who has set an example. And many others who were bent because of Christ. Others were bent upside down. The one who wrote this book was imprisoned in a forlorn island, alone, lonely. But he paid the price for the gospel. Brethren, I want to tell you in advance, if you want to be a Christian, there's joy, yes. There's peace, yes. There's a whole future, yes. That is the truth. But there's also the other side. And we must be telling people the truth. There's a price to pay. There's a price to pay. Each one who must follow Christ must carry his cross. Don't be deceived by some people who say you're going to be a multi you may be a multimillionaire, no problem. But even in that, you will pay a price for the gospel. Each Christian, when you come to Christ, you carry your cross. You carry your cross. But in that cross, the burden is light because he walks with you and strengthens you and gives you his joy. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's move on. The other thing that we um, uh, we continue, we're talking, continuing to talk about Christ, Jesus. In, in, uh, if you go to uh, Isaiah, let's, ch let's just go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. We're just now looking into the message of Christ that he brought from the Father, that the Father sent him, and the, the acknowledgement of the Father on him. Uh, Isaiah 61, he says, uh, okay, I can hear you turning on your laptops, tablets, uh, phones, and the uh, leaves of books. Let me give you a bit of time. Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me as Jesus Christ because the Lord has anointed me so he just didn't make himself so as but I'm going to go with a message he was anointed to bring good news to the afflicted he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to captives we shall look at that and freedom to prisoners those who are bound by sin Proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, which we, again we shall look at in verse 7. To comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called ox of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So Christ here is saying he has been sent to represent the Father. He has been sent to represent the Father. In fact, in Hebrews, he, he talks about, if you have seen me, he is the exact representation of God. He is the exact. So if you see, as he told Thomas, if you see me, you have seen God the Father. And so this work is from the heart of the Father to through Christ Jesus to you and me. And what is this work? 
You've been anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring good news to the afflicted. Not only afflicted by sorrow and pain and, and going through a difficult time, maybe you're having a hard time that he has come for, but also afflicted by sin, by the bondage of sin. Some people have been demon-possessed. Some people have been bewitched. Some people are being, uh, have gone through a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of stuff. He has come for the afflicted. If you are afflicted, then Christ is the one for you. And he has sent me to bind up their broken hearted. Those who are broken because they have realized their sinfulness. But those who, have been, who are broken because they are suffering disappointments. Those who are broken hearted because of so much stuff they are going through. If you are broken hearted, Christ is for you. There is no breaking that he cannot repair. Nothing. And to proclaim liberty to captives, this one I'll, I'll reserve it because we're going to look at it later, and freedom to prisoners, uh, freedom to prisoners. And so this is the message of Christ. And he was so confident about this message. You remember what he did? He just walked in the, in the chapel, uh, in the synagogue and stood and read this scripture and closed the book. And the Pharisees were amazed and shocked. Who is this who is so confident? Who is this who is so sure of, of himself? Who is this? He was saying me. He claimed that he was the one sent by God. He claimed and he said you people must believe in me, in him and entrust their lives in him. He had the power to forgive sins. What shall I say? Uh, stand up and carry your, 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 your bed? No, I can also say your sins are also forgiven. And they were upset. That is the authority that he had. And that's the authority that Christ came, came on earth with. And that is the authority that Jesus Christ has today to forgive sins, to heal the sick. The other aspect of him being a witness is that he is the only one who had the authority to reveal the Father. I mentioned it earlier on. but You see, you and me, we don't even know the Father. Have you ever seen him? God is invisible. No one can see God. But he had the authority to reveal the Father. And he proved all this by his character, by his gracious words, and by the great miracles he did. Remember Christ raised people from the dead. Remember those uh, people who were blind could see. Remember the, the multitude of miracles that Christ did. In fact, it is written that if you were to write everything that Jesus Christ did, the books of the earth will be filled and there will be no space. He did so much good. And he did when he was dying. That man just said, this is a man of, this is a child of God. Why? He proved. Uh, that's why the apostles were able to say in 1 John, we have walked with him three years closely. And we have eaten with him. We have laughed with him. We have cried with him. We can testify that this man is a man of God. He is God himself. How many of us? How many of us, brethren, can someone who has worked with us for three years in many situations and still come up and say, this one is a child of God? How many of our neighbors can be able to say that? Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to the other aspect. And so, brethren, when we live on this earth, we must begin to imitate the ways of Christ Jesus. Verse 5 still it says, the firstborn of the dead. The firstborn of the dead is another definition which we are defining. What is it saying the firstborn of the dead? If we read 1 Colossians, if you could turn to 1 Colossians, 1 Colossians chapter 1. 1 Colossians chapter 1, 
verse 18. It says, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have a first place in everything. Simply put, he was the first person to die and resurrect and come back to life. Where is Christ? Go to the grave and search for it. Look at all the other religion and go and look for them. I don't want to mention any name, but go to the graveyard. People go to the graveyard. You will find their bodies there. Their bones at least are there. Christ resurrected and he, he came and showed himself to many witnesses. And therefore, he was the first to die and defeat death. He overcame death and, and fought with it and sorted it out and came out and came back victorious. Now, why is the resurrection important? Briefly, why is it important? If Christ had not risen, you and me would be doomed. We would have had no hope. It would have meant because on that cross he was dying for our sins, it would have meant that in that grave, sin had overcome him. <coughs> and he had been defeated. And that was the end of your hope and me. So the resurrection is the foundation of the Christian faith. We don't serve a dead Jesus. Some people worship philosophies of people, of, of, of their prophets and so on but that person is long dead but we are serving a living god jesus is alive and because he's alive he's able to save us completely and he's able to stand for us and he's able to give us life that is a very important don't ignore this my brethren, don't ignore this. But also the fact that he rose means that the father accepted his sacrifice. Remember there were two brothers. One offered an animal and the sacrifice was accepted. The other one went and cut rape, cabbage, somalia, <laughs> baby marrow, and put a fire. I don't that's fresh vegetables, right? and put a fire, the smoke went and all over the place, and the father didn't accept it. God didn't accept it. And he ended up killing his young brother. Why well, it was not accepted. It's the same thing. Christ Jesus, his sacrifice was accepted. And because it was accepted, it is a proof that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans chapter 1. <coughs> just an advert we are doing romans and uh, bible study adult bible study to do you good to come here it is it says verse 3 romans chapter 1 verse 3 it says concerning his son who was born of the descendant of david according to the flesh who look at verse 4 let me read it slowly who was declared the son of god with power by the resurrection from the dead. He is being resurrected, proved that he was the son of God. And that's how important it is. And therefore he bore our sins um, as it is in the scriptures. And because of this, We are free today, and we are a savior. Let's move on. Um, it says, not only the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. He was a ruler. Let's go to Psalm 89. And we must sometimes it's good to interpret scripture with scripture. Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verse 27. 
it says yes it says i also shall make him my firstborn you see how bible how the bible is consistent eh? the highest of the kings of the earth the highest of the kings of the earth brethren jesus christ of all the presidents that you know of all the kings that you know of all the highest of the highest of the highest that you know christ is ruling them right now not yesterday christ is ruling the whole universe christ is ruling this earth all the continents all the kingdoms all the countries all the nations christ is the ruler of all the presidents including our own president he is ruled by christ jesus you may not see christ jesus coming with sirens and motorcycles but he's ruling and that rule is a rule with a purpose as we shall see when we shall be ending <clears throat> to bring everything to close history to close so even the decisions that are there in in cabinet meetings it in in buckingham palace whatever decisions are made in the bible says the heart of the king is in the hands of the lord he turns it around according to his purpose like a river like water and so even in that christ has got an agenda has got a purpose we you and me may not know it but we know the end game that he's finally coming again and so he's working things decisions that and 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 so many intricacies as someone says he's knitting this this doido or whatever it is some of you young people don't know what it is okay he's he's making this chitenge cloth with patterns and so on and it's only when you unveil that thing that you say, okay this is beautiful right now christ is working even in the evil decisions he doesn't do the evil but the the bible talks about the the wrath of the enemy shall praise his name they do evil but he takes that wrong thing they are doing and works his own purposes they'll be judged for their evil but in everything that happens on earth christ is at work even in the worst ruler christ is at work he uses even the devil to bring glory to his name certain things he has done his way like this time where he did his way organized people to crucify him and took him on the cross and the bible says the rulers of the earth didn't know and the devil didn't know had they known they would not have crucified the lord of glory he was shooting himself in the leg by putting christ on the cross christ dies and resurrects sin taken keys of death taken from the devil the christ says no can i have those keys i've died for them can i have can i have that bondage those chains you were tying my people collects them and the devil now remains and then he says my goodness why did i have this man crucified had he known him he thought he was doing his worst but his worst was the best for us just as an example of how christ works and so christ is working in every institution he's working in every organization he is the ruler of your manager he is your the ruler of every single person but you will not see it always sometimes you will show it sometimes it is hidden but we shall see the final chitenge and it shall be beautiful brethren christ is the ruler ephesians chapter 1 will tell us a bit more <coughs> ephesians chapter 1 Will tell us more verse 19 it says Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 let me give you time to look at it and the apostle paul here is praying for us that our eyes may be enlightened that we may understand these things and then it says verse 19 and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places so the power that resurrected christ jesus is the power that is at work in you and me if you are born again even the weakest believer the one who's born again today 
that power which raised Christ Jesus from the dead is available and is at work in him. Only that you don't know it and you don't use it. That is our, we are perishing for lack of knowledge. Otherwise your status is higher in the spiritual realm than you accept, than you acknowledge, than you are even using. Sad for you and me, my brethren. But let's go on. And it says, um, and seated him at his, at his right hand in the heavenly places. Look at 21. Far above all rule. So the Bible talks about principalities, powers, and authority. Those are the demonic structures of Satan and his principalities, powers, and authorities. Those are the demonic. It says far above, far above Satan and all his rules. All, all those principalities are, are, are beneath me. Authority and the power and the dominion anywhere on this earth. Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest king, but he was made to eat grass. God says, you are going to eat grass. He left his kingdom, ate grass like a cow. When the time came, he says, okay, now you can stop eating grass. There is chicken and chips here, come. And he ate and he says, people, I declare today that the God of Israel is the God of the universe, and he repented of his wickedness. Above any dominion, and every name that is named, whether you are whatever name that is there which you regard as the highest name on this earth, that is small. Not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Right through the ages, forever and ever and ever, Christ shall be king of kings. Christ shall have dominion. Christ shall have authority. Christ shall have power. And 22 says, he has put all things. The Bible doesn't put words for nothing. He has put all things in subjection under his defeat. Everything that you regard, that you respect, that you value is under Christ. Under his feet. And gave him as head over all things to the church. Look at where we come in now as a church, as a Christian church. Here we come in. Everything over all to the church. Because we are heirs. So what Christ owns, we own. What is under his feet is under our feet. Hallelujah. Which is his body. The church is his body. So whatever, when Christ is walking and crushing those you are there also crushing them, hammering them, destroying them, because we are his body. Can someone leave his body and walk like a, 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 a phantom? No. We are his body where he is, we are. The fullness of him who fills all. And so, brethren, this is what it means when it is saying, That he's king of kings, he's ruler of all the kings of the earth, he's ruling them now. If you miss anything, just know that Christ is ruling all the kings, all the presidents, all the emperors now. Let's go on. The last uh, part of five says, to him who loves us. And released us from our sins by his blood. And look at that word love. For me, my version says love. It's a present tense. Jesus loves you. That's all. Jesus loves you. You may be hated by people. You may be gossiped by people. You, you may even not even like yourself enough. You may even think, I oh, know there's something wrong with my finger or something wrong with my nose. Especially the young people, they're always on the mirror pressing pimples and, and thinking they could be better and so on. Jesus loves you with all those pimples. We even those funny walks that you walk, you young people. Jesus loves you. I hope it can change, of course. He loves you. He loves you the way you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. When he was in heaven, there, before he came on earth, he was him, the father and the son. And when they looked at you, they looked at who you should be. They, they knitted you and, and molded you and, and 
made you, uh, that same nose is cute to Christ. Those same eyes, that same height is beautiful to him. He wanted you to be like that. He loves you. Even in your most worst of situations, he loves you. Love. And there's no greater love. Let me give you only one evidence. How many of you can die for me? I didn't say you should raise your hands because I'd be disappointed. How many can die for me? But there's no greater love than that someone should die for another. He walked on earth and he realized you and me needed a savior and we're dying by the wrath of God. What did he do? He died. There's no greater love than that. If someone can die for you, he loves you completely. Not those romantic words you will write, the roses are red, violets are blue, the angel in heaven is thinking of you. Those are ancient. We used to have those methods. <laughs> I don't know what is there now. Uh, but not those charming things just to chaff you. No, it doesn't chaff. A person who dies for you is not chaffing you. He loves you. He has always loved you. He loves you. He will always love you. He's a faithful witness. Standing in your place for you. He's got your back forever. So just remember that. Though the whole world forsake you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. Whether persecution, whether trials, whether your body is rotting with disease, whether whatever situation, whether you are forgotten, forsaken, whether you have failed your exams, whether you have no money for school fees, whether you have no money to buy food in your fridge, whether your car is run down, whatever, I will never leave you nor forsake you, and nothing shall ever separate you from the love of Christ. Not even demons can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing on this earth that is created will ever sep separate you from the, his love. It is in here, embedded, intertwined. You are part of his body. Kill Christ, then you can also be separated from him forever. Bear that in mind. That's what the Bible says. Let's go on. And it says, he released us, the last part of verse 5, from our sins by his blood. Uh, the ancients um, uh, use a, a different word, but the point, it says, he loosed us in his blood. That's what it is saying. He released us, but it's like... You, 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 are, you are bondage, you are, there are chains here, and then you will go in the blood of Jesus, and those chains just break free. You are loosed in his blood, not away from his blood, not aside, not under his blood, but as you go in his blood, in this shower, you know those car washes, they're not very common in Zambia, where you put your car in, and it's being washed, and is cleaning them up and so on. You come out, the car is clean. So you go in and the blood of, of Christ, because it also in Zechariah talks about a fountain. It's like a fountain. You go in this fountain. There's a fountain filled with blood. You go in spraying and you go in in your chains, bound foot and, and, and hand and, and everything. And your eyes are also imprisoned. You can't see, you, you can't hear. You are, you are a slave and you go in and everything is set free. It's your body which is cleansed, but your inner man is also cleansed. You are set free. You are a prisoner. You come out of there, a new person, loosed from the devil's clutches. Why the cross? Had he known the devil that this was going to happen, he would not have had Christ crucified. I assure you. It was a blunder, a universal blunder, an eternal blunder. Up to today, the devil is kicking himself. You are free by the blood of Jesus Christ. The fountain has washed you and set you free. But then, let's go into just a little bit more detail. How did his blood free us? In Matthew 20, verse 28, you can write it down. I am just, um, I'm emphasizing what I've already said, but I need to give you a scripture. The Son of Man, Matthew 20, verse 28, came to give his life a ransom for many. As I mentioned, our sentence for sin was death. 
The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. If you are living in sin right now, your wages, your salary will be death. If you are living in righteousness, in obedience to Christ, your salary will be eternal life. I'm not saying you work for salvation, but I'm saying you are walking in righteousness in Christ Jesus. But definitely, if you are living in sin now, you are a champion, you are a star, and everyone knows that those are the people, those are the people who, live, who are living, and you ignore Christ, the wages of sin is death. And so there is, there is this sentence on every person born of Adam, every human being born, there's a sentence of death. And Christ feels sorry, as I mentioned, and he takes, pays that price for you and me because of that. And you can imagine what happened when he talks about the blood. If you know what happened to Christ is that he was whipped. And those whips, someone said, were, were, had nails and he was torn to pieces. He, he, he was, he, he was uh, hit by nails, tough steel nails. Not these nails, uh, Chinese nails that you see when you hit, they bent. No, no, steel nails. Steel nails, proper steel nails. And they went and pierced him. His feet, his hands, his head, his side was chopped by spears and blood with water came out. He was a bloody mess by the end of the day when he was on that cross. And the blood poured, wounded, alive. They don't do this uh, when, 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 when you are dead. They do it when you are seen. They just come with it. While you are alive. And this is how it was done. And he didn't change his mind. He had the power to change his mind. But he just says, he was a faithful witness. It's for, for Charles that I'm doing this. It's okay. And it was shit. They put a stone on his head, bleeding from every part of his body. Remember in the garden, he, he was sweating and he was even bleeding from the pores of his body. All that bloody mess was for you and me. So when you say the blood did it, he's saying his death was sufficient because God's anger was upon him and as I said God was satisfied and that is why <coughs> you and me can walk today but this is how your sin and mine is this is how evil your sin and mine is this is how terrible this is the price for sin if you just go and see how Christ suffered that is the price of your sin that's how evil in the eyes of God sin is and if we don't understand our sinfulness, if you have not reached that point and recognize that sin is sin and sin is evil, if where you are seated there, you have not reached a point where you have felt that, yes, indeed, I am a sinner, and that my sin is sin and it is wrong and it is a transgression and it is bad, then you cannot be a Christian. And you are not a Christian. A Christian has to recognize the sinfulness of his sin, the badness of the badness, the badness of the evil. But if you are like Judas, yes, oh no, Chavi, I killed the Savior. In the name of Yeshua, let me go and hang myself. Instead of rushing to Christ, you go and hang yourself. You are not a Christian. Judas is in hell, I can be sure of that. Because he didn't go to Christ. After that offense, I assure you, had you gone to Christ and said, but Zona, I have committed evil. Look at the price that was paid for you. Forgive me, Lord, I repent. He is faithful and just if we confess our sins to forgive us all our faithfulness. He's a faithful witness. Remember. So have you reached a point where you recognize your sinfulness? Or are you always making it such a weakness? Making it just a weakness. Or do you not even know that you're a sinner? You, you don't see anything wrong with what you do. Why do we go for a bath? Why do we go for a shower? Because we feel dirty. A clean person doesn't go for a shower. So if you are clean, stay in your cleanness. There's nothing we can do. You are clean. But you are going to meet him. As we are going to see as we end, it shall be a disaster. If I were you, I'll reevaluate my life, reanalyze it, and say, those things I have been doing, are they really all right? The blood of Jesus can cleanse you from every single thing. There's nothing the blood of Jesus cannot do. Okay, we have looked at verse 5. Let's, secondly, let's look at verse uh, 6 now. 
and he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and father to him, the glory and dominion forever. So, so secondly, verse 6 tells us that we are now, you see, we've not only been washed. This is the beauty about Christianity. You've not only been washed from your sin. He now takes you. In your sinfulness and, and, and in your loneliness, he now brings you, as the scripture is saying, and makes you a child. You become a child. And you now you become a part of his kingdom. And part of his priesthood. 1 Peter, quickly. 1 Peter. Quickly, we thought we can... Uh, verse 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. It says, having been born again, having been scrubbed and washed by the blood of Jesus, you are a chosen race. Chosen by God because he came to you. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim his excellence. Your status changes. You are a nobody. Look at verse 10. You were not a people, but now you are a people of God. You were nothing. You were, you were nothing. But now you are a people of God. You have an identity. You have a surname. Charles Jesus Christ. You have an identity now. You belong somewhere. And not only this, it also brings about the fact that it's a kingdom of priests. So when you have when you belong to a kingdom of priests, this is very important for you, Evangel Baptist Church. God's organized empire or nation. This is what you are. God's organized empire or nation with structures. And people have roles. That's where now it comes to us. You are not just saved and said, okay, Papa, go, you go in the bush and, and cut trees and, and begin to do nothing. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He doesn't, he doesn't save you for nothing. He saves you and me for a purpose. In this overhaul ruling of the nation, you are part of that agenda once you are saved. You are part of that kingdom to which he's working quietly over rulers and principles and, and princesses and kings. You are now part of that agenda. You are part of the game plan. If you like football, you are part of that game plan. He's the chief coach. And so I am saying, Evangel Baptist Church, what is your role in this kingdom? It's here. If you're a Christian, you're part of it. What do you do at church? What do you do in your life? What is your purpose in your life? What are you here for? Watching TV? Watching Netflix? Or Facebook the whole day? With all those funny jokes? What are you saved for? Have you found your role? Have you found your purpose in this salvation, in this Christianity? Look at the bees. I mean, look. The bees don't even have the intelligence that you and me have. But look at the bees. Some of them make that chima hive. Huh? They make it. Huh? <coughs> so they come, make the hive, and so on, with a lot of things in them. I won't go into the details, and they make the hive. Others are workers. Beyond 20,000, 40,000 are just workers who go and collect the pollen. Just a little pollen and bring. Everyone is doing his role. Everyone is doing, to feed those my babies. There's a mother queen who now makes those my babies in those my, my honey. So they make the honey, they convey, they make the honey. Others are God. That's why when you go to a beehive, unless you are brave, you will run away, they'll bite you. Why? There are soldiers also there guarding the hive. That's their work. Then the, the, then, then the, the others who also come and clean. I was reading on this and I enjoyed myself. They come and keep that hive clean. Sometimes dust can come. They come and keep that hive clean. They also come and keep it warm to keep the temperature so that those babies don't die. And when it gets too, too hot, they flap their wings and it becomes cool. Just the right temperature. Look at the intelligence. That's why when someone says there's evolution, uh, can accident to do such a thing, you people. If you have believed in evolution, throw it today. It's a fake. 
and they flap their rings and it's cool. And so they, they regulate the temperature so that those small baby bees eventually come out alive and fly and increase the, the family. So what are you doing? No one comes and says, no, me, I'm just flapping my wings. Z. Others, Z, uh, uh, see me, they go and collect the pollen. Me, I'm just guarding chubby like a statue. What is my work? Others are doing that and that. That is the job assigned for you. You will be amazed that if you do that work sincerely and earnestly, you will get a reward which even the public person may never ever get. So what is your job? What is your job in Evangel Baptist Church? What are you doing? Coming to church? When you want our elder, go back home and live a different life. What is your work? Even the bees are doing more work than you and me. Why? Shame to you and me. What is your work? He saved us. Workmanship. A priest. You know what a priest does, brethren? A priest is the one who points people to God. He's the one who, who, who shows them the truth so that they will worship God in the truth. He is the one who, who gives them the requirements of God and represents so that they do the right thing. And it's saying you're a royal priesthood. God's priests. But who, who are you teaching at your home? Who are you teaching in your neighborhood? Who among the young people are you teaching here? Or who among the older people are you teaching and, and working with? Why are you just aloof? And time is going. Christ is coming as we shall see soon. He's coming soon. <coughs> so what do you do for God in your area, in your neighborhood? Are you known for that work? If they came at you, they will jump your house. Or <laughs> they will jump your house. They'll go to another person. They'll jump your classroom if you're a young person. Or they'll jump your office. No, no, no. There's a Christian there. But they leave you because there's no testimony of Christ. You're not a priest to the people that you've been given. You're negligent. You and me need to repent. Let's go to the third and final point. Then we can end the day. Third and final point, brethren, is Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. It says... Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is. When the word says, when the word behold, it means, it, you know, I was, I was just checking the documentation, and it says, this word, you find it 1,298 times in the Bible. Behold, and it only comes at critical times. Behold means come and see. It also means stand still and see. It also means pay attention. Listen. Stop doing what you are doing. Behold, I am coming. So if you are doing anything now, if you are thinking of, of going home, if you are doing now, I'm saying behold. Be still. Just for this next three, four, five minutes. Behold, Christ is coming. Jesus is coming again. He says, I'm coming with the clouds. When it says the clouds, he's not talking about the nimbuses and so on. But he's saying, I am coming. Let's, let's go first of all to uh, Matthew 24 so that we can, I'd, I, I'm failing to express it. So let, let the Bible express it itself. Matthew 24, uh, verse 30. Uh, we are concluding. And he said, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So when it says on the clouds, it is really saying he's coming with such a powerful entourage that Every single person from, un from, uh, from continent to 
continent who will see him coming. Not those from a fake Christ who come. They, they are in New York or they are in Zambezia. And they say, no, I am Jesus Christ. Come on, be serious. Jesus Christ will come with glory, with such a greatness that every eye shall see him. The cloud that we are talking about is the majesty and great glory. Oh, his holy angels. You know, when the president is passing, the cars are stopped and you see now motorcycles, motorcycles, and then ambulances, and then big cars and so on, moving. And even when he's moving, uh, you go to some place and you find he's out of the car and he's greeting people. He's surrounded. There's a cloud that's just surrounded. Christ, it, that is nothing. But you come with angels. He will come with, with, with holy angels, with tens of thousands of saints, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet. That song which says, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, you will hear a loud trumpet from where east to west, north to south. Everyone will hear that trumpet of God. And we shall know it's the end. Then we look, we shall see him. And others will be crying. Because they will know who he is. If you don't have Christ Jesus, you will mourn. You will mourn and tears will flood your face. And in repentance, say, I didn't know. I, I, I took you lightly. I repent. You will mourn. But it's too late. The door has been closed. There's no room for repentance. Swap. It's finished. There will be no more repentance at that particular time. That's it. It's closed. He has come. He has come for judgment. Every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. No. He's talking about he having resurrected. When they rise, they will see him. Ah, this is the man we killed. This is the man we mocked. This is the man we spat at. But even you and me, we pierce him. When you despise Christ, when you're being told and you make a joke, some, there are some hymns which have made, made, I can't even repeat it, but have been made into a joke. When you joke about things of God, when you disrespect Christ, when you do all those things, the word is being pushed, you don't listen, you don't pay attention, you are piercing him. You are taking a knife and putting it in his side. You who pierce Christ will mourn. You will cry. Your tears will be seen, but it will be too late to repent. He will be coming to judge. He will be coming to judge. The time is gone. The time is now. If you want to repent, if you want to do it, it's now. Otherwise, if you refuse this word I'm giving you now, which I'm sharing in Jesus' name, you are piercing him. And you will see him when he comes and you will mourn. And there's no one knows when Christ is coming, by the way. He's coming like a thief in the night. Does the thief come and say, I'm coming in Europe at midnight in days of Quivira. I'm coming to break the door. Be ready. Oh. You'll be ready for him. You'll shoot him. Christ is coming like a thief in the night. You don't know the hour. It could even be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be, it could be in two weeks' time. Any time. You see, he has been working in history. All along from the time that he resurrected and he has been working through the rulers, through different uh, ways to come towards the culmination of everything is to come and end to come back. He's coming and he's coming again. He's a faithful witness. So you who despise Jesus Christ and you think it's a joke, repent. You who are loving those funny things, the worldliness, repent. Let me close. Let me come to the conclusion and we close. Even those who pierced him and the tribes of earth will mourn. They will be mourned because they are now filled with horror, fear, and doom. He is coming for judgment. He is coming to close history in this world. He is coming to take his own. Those who are born again, his own, he will take them. He is coming to bring a new government. This earth will be destroyed. Fire will come upon this earth. That's why you should not put your heart on these things of the world. They will be destroyed. They are dying. The Bible says they are passing away. But there will come a time when this earth will be destroyed. A new heaven and a new earth will come. And Christ will be our light and our ruler. Repent. And you'll be saved. If you don't turn to Jesus Christ, you are in a big mess. There's nothing like I'm too young, I'm too old. 
repent or no everyone knows that I'm a Christian can't you just pretending to be a Christian check yourself because when he comes you mourn because the truth will be seen you won't be taken repent turn to Christ brethren I have shared the word if you have further questions about your salvation we are here the elders are here and we can talk to you please after the service just approach us so this is not a joke he's coming and he's coming to break righteousness and justice you shouldn't be in that place i beg you may god bless his word